right now on episode 54 of The Flip Side, we're gonna learn why you can't be happy unless you understand Interpersonal neurobiology. Interpersonal neurobiology. Here we go, right wow. now on the flip side. Hey, wow. Hey everyone, welcome to the flip side. I know I say this every week, but it's really true this week. This is my all time favorite episode because finally they got me some smart people to be on this podcast with me. I have got everyone's flip side favorite, Stephanie Kane. Oh Dr. Stephanie Kane oh is back. And Yay. I've been having a hard time getting you on the podcast because now you are working at William Jessup University. Yeah, I'm teaching now. You are back to teaching. Yep. Man, their game. The flip side's <laughs> lost, but I'm glad you're it's here. It's always an honor to be today. invited. And then yeah. uh, we are bicontinental, because of course, uh, uh, bi-coastal, I mean, because Stephanie's from Atlanta and we're in Northern California. And we are also bicontinental because I have my favorite French slash Irish, but she met her husband in Scotland, Western European <laughs> person on the show, Isabel McCourt here. Well done, Kurt, you got that right. I did yeah. get that right, didn't yeah. Thank you for having me. And Isabel, I don't know if you knew this, but Isabel is in charge of our prayer ministry here at Bayside and does a phenomenal job, which is definitely gonna apply in the passage we're looking at this week. But before we get in the passage, we gotta do what we do on the flip side, and that is Serena. Everyone meet Serena. Serena is our Thrive Intern of Glory this year. And she's, you got some coffee for us, Serena? I do. Is it ready? It what do we got? Ready. We have Burf Coffee Roasters Single Origin from Ethiopia. Ooh, yes, so the African. Fancy. Good thing we're having the African because that's my favorite. And I'm the only one on this episode, the flip side, who is going to drink coffee because, true. as you've learned, if you're a flip side fan, I have water. Oh, Stephanie Kane is allergic yeah. to caffeine. Yeah. Oh, I think She's, I'm, I might have tea. Is that okay? See, Irish peace. I have I to see. have tea, not really a French. Okay, person. get rid of this cup. Yeah. Get rid of this that, cup. Can I, can Hannah, get us, <laughs> get us the. So, cheers, everybody. It. There we go. We have water, tea. A little tea. That looks Ethiopian. so European. I love that. This mug. is my Kath Kidston mug, yeah. Stephanie. Okay, we're losing all the Shout men. out to the we're losing all the men right now. Kath Kidston. Great mug. Yeah. <laughs> it is a great mug. All right. <laughs> Let's get into the content. Acts 2.42, this is the classic passage. Uh, this is my most frequently, uh, yes, Kurt, what have you preached on through the years the most? It's Acts 2.42, I've probably preached on this passage more. Uh, especially when you minister to college students, this is the pinnacle of the goal of what you want church to be. So you're trying to get a young person to go, how do you want to live your life as a church person? Um, it's not tradition, it's not denomination, it's Acts 2.42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together, had everything in common. They sold their property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts, that's the big meeting, and they broke bread in their homes, their small groups, and they ate, ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God, enjoying the favor of all the people, and here's the kicker, and the Lord added to their number daily. I mean, this, this is what we're all looking for. Oh, yes. They had the unity, and they had the fruit, and they had the favor. So we're just gonna go through it, and, and I'm gonna ask you guys some questions, and as always, we're gonna banter back and forth. I, can this, here's the biggest question. Can this happen again? Can we be devoted to what they were devoted and see these same results? Right here at the beginning, it says they were devoted to the apostles' teaching. Isabel, how in the world do I be a person who's devoted to the apostles' teaching here in 2019 in California? Do you know there are so many voices, right, in our world? So many blogs, so many pages you can turn to on the internet, so many self-help books. And I have found um, on my few years here on earth that going back to the Bible and the Bible teachings has been my surest form. How do you do that? Now, what, tell me about your, what does what your Bible study look like in the life of Isabel McCourt? All right. So we have a crazy chair in our living room, um, uh, front it, room in our house. It's literally, it it's literally looks like a piece of Jackson Pollock art. Does it? Well, there yeah, we yeah. go. All right. 
say. This Maybe is an educated piece. Right. It's a beautiful chair. Yes. That's so the chair. We fight over that chair. Andrew loves it in the evening. I love it in the mornings. But I love to sit there and I love to just go. St- I mean, I'm a grumpy person. If I don't go there first, you don't want to meet me. So it's really to everybody's advantage. I should <laughs> sit in that chair with my cat gets and cup of tea and then open my Bible. And I do that actually through your Bible reading app. I just go to the one-year Bible. Right now I'm doing the chronological Bible. And it just gives me this methodical way of digging into scripture every day and I'm just amazed every single day God speaks to me and I'll just highlight one or two parts of what I'm reading copy it onto my notes and that is literally my spiritual food for the day I can't go without breakfast about how much do you actually read how much do you you like do you know when it comes out in that format um, I love it because particularly the Bible in one year gives me a few Mm -hmm. chapters of an Old Testament passage then gives me a few chapters of a New Testament passage and there's life in both Um, but one of my my favorite pieces is it gives me a psalm and that's really my prayer to God as I'm reading I'm interacting with God I'm not just reading words I'm listening to him and then those psalms that were written so many years ago are actually a voice of somebody trying to relate to God like I am today and so I read those I speak those to God and then proverbs two three proverbs I can't read whole chapters of proverbs Two, three proverbs. Two, three verses. Yeah, because Mm -hmm. it's just enough wisdom for today. And I just store that, save that. And I'm just amazed day after day of how handy that comes in, how much God was knowing what my day was going to be like and what I was going to need. So I love it. I can't do without it. Stephanie, what do you do to devote yourself to the apostles' teaching? You know, as you were reading that passage, I was just inspired by people's actions. Mm. And so... For me, it's being around a community of people who are acting out their faith. Mm. I'm inspired by their courageousness, by their generosity, by their love for each other. And that gives me something tangible that I can do. I can look at somebody and go, you know what? If this person is making a sacrifice of time or resources for the sake of this greater cause, then I can do something too. Yeah. And so it's just being in an environment with other people who totally are being obedient. To I had that. a person in my small group who was memorizing the entire book of First Timothy. Mm-hmm. And I thought, I should do that. Yeah. But, but I didn't. But I thought, <laughs> I thought, yeah. you know, it really, and, and I'd say our ability as a human to memorize things is way, way more than we think we are in our busy world. And she was just going, I've got, kids, teenagers that I'm trying to raise. I've got a marriage I'm trying to put Mm -hmm. together. I've got a business that I'm trying to run. And therefore, I have to be grounded in the apostles' teaching Mm -hmm. and and the word of God. So I'm going to make time to do that. And I thought, man, she's busier than me. And yet she's, just like you said, she's inspiring all of us to go Mm -hmm. and we can make Mm -hmm. uh, time for this. One of the the things I do along that same line, not just inspired by... um, the people around me, but I try to be inspired by people in history. I love reading biographies and autobiographies Mm -hmm. as a way of being devoted to the apostles' teaching. I want to know Hudson Taylor. I I, I have this little paperback biography Mm -hmm. of Hudson Taylor. It's one of the few books I reread. I want to know how did Hudson Taylor devote himself to the Bible? Mm -hmm. I I don't want to reinvent this. I want to go, how did he do that? Mm -hmm. And there's something about uh, either a history book of the church or a biography or an autobiography that will reignite my passion to be a studier and to be a devoted person to mastering um, the word of God. Mm-hmm. So what? why is it that I, I, I have the suspicion, tell me if you guys agree with it, that not many people are actually studying the Bible on their own. That, that, that if we knew how many people don't have a daily devotion time or don't have any set aside time to read or memorize or look at or understand uh, the books of the Bible, we would be shocked at how few are actually studying the Bible. I mean, I think it's it's a daunting task and there's just such a reverence for the word of God and the fact that it is, you know, inspired by the creator of the universe. And you think, can I actually spend time and understand this vast and complex world. Dude, this is why I love you, Stephanie, because you are you are taking the empathetic approach. <laughs> I'm the hard one going, why aren't y'all having your devotions? Should all be sitting in a crazy chair? And you're like, you guys in leadership have made it too hard. You've we talked about the Bible. This is what I heard you just say that. And I think you're right. You've talked about the Bible like only the greatest minds can handle it. And I, I think some people preach in such a way that makes the Bible less likely to be studied. Yeah. 
because it's in, they they found these great nuggets and they they did these great illustrations and you think I can't get that. And that's I'm good for gonna... a particular audience. Sure. But I think for the broad audience, people are looking for something they can relate to. Right? Yes. And so um, I love and I've appreciated that at Bayside is just the application piece, how that's such a big driving piece. And okay, what do I do with this? How does this apply to my life? Because that's how information gets stored to your long-term memory. It's not just reading a verse over and over and over again. It's reading a verse going, okay, let me attach an experience or a feeling I have with this verse. Before you know it, it's stored in your long-term memory and it can come up. Yes. Um, and so I think it's making meaning out of it rather than just making presenting me, yeah. it. Yeah. One of my mentors, Dick Schroeder, always said, you know the difference between meditation and Christian meditation is meditation is thinking about a thought over and over again. Mm -hmm. Christian meditation is thinking how should I apply this? Mm -hmm. It's taking pauses and thoughtful absences to go, what am I going to do about this? And I asked the Holy Spirit to help me. You know, I, you know, before I go in and I'm starting to read a passage and I feel overwhelmed, and I go, Holy Spirit, I'm about to do this. Show me what you want me to know about this. Help me to understand it in a way that it's going to stay with me and then bring it up in experiences that I have in my life where I need it. Yeah. Right. And then I have faith and belief that the Holy Spirit will answer that, and then I just go right in. Because then it's not me doing it. I'm like, I'm counting on the Holy Spirit. I have a really that. simple system that I tell people to do. I said, first of all, you what you want to do is understand the genres of the Bible. And this is where I think preachers make this really difficult. They, they talk about what they learned in the scripture, like no one else can learn it that way. Mm -hmm. You know, I was meeting with God and this thing, here's the, oh, you, what a revelation. You really got me with that one. Instead of talking about the Bible and going, listen, you can get the same thing I get. Right. If you understand just a couple hermeneutical ideas, and one of them's just the genre. What is the genre? So you go from the genre. So you've just used a big word, yeah. hermeneutical. So that's just how you yes. interpret the Bible. Right. Right. Let's translate, right? Her yeah. Hermeneutical, yeah. yes. Yeah. Okay, uh -huh. uh, okay. <laughs> Serena, you're a Thrive student. Do you know what the definition of hermeneutics is? I don't even know. Um, <laughs> I don't remember. The it tools... It's the, interpretation. It's, I, I, I teach right. It's, it's what does that mean, right? It's what, the what's rules of interpretation. So yeah. hermeneutics is the tools we use to get the original meaning of the text. Right. So you might use the tool of a good question. What is the context? What's the setting? Who's the audience? Who's the author? You might lose a literal tool, a Greek lexicon, or a, but there are tools you use. And so you start with those simple tools. The best book, and I've recommended it on the flip side, is How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth. It's about that thick. You can read it in one day or two days max. And, and really, once you start getting an understanding of the literature, it's not that hard. It's not that intimidating. 95% of all passages are easy to interpret. We, the theologian, theological men, and I mean men specifically, like to fight and argue about 5% and it intimidates everyone. Uh, but once you understand the genre, then you just have to ask this question. What did it mean to the original hearers? Mm -hmm. So the worst small group question that you get all the time is, what does this passage mean to you? Stupid question. No, what did it mean to them? What was the yeah. original meaning? Context. And then yeah. it's yeah. your question, which is, how do I apply it? What did it mean to them? Mm -hmm. How do I apply That's it? Good. What did it mean to them? How do... Those two simple, if you know a little bit about the genre and you ask those two questions, all of the Bible comes open to you and you're like, this thing that they made me feel was so intimidating is really not that intimidating. Mm -hmm. They are us. What mm -hmm. they're going through and how God's treating them is really exactly what I'm going through and how God's yeah, treating And the me. amazing thing in those questions, right, when you don't feel like the biggest theologian in the world and you're just here because you, you, you love God and you want to live according to what he's asking you to do, you have so many resources, literally, touching a screen. Right? Totally, totally. We used to, we used to have to go right, and right. buy the many commentaries for each book of the Bible. And then if you pulled Very one, true. you didn't have the other. Yeah. Here you just type in one verse and you go on, what does it mean? And you do have those commentaries, right? Yes. Right there at your disposal. Do you know how much Greek I remember from my school days, my theological study days? I remember agape, <laughs> I know, <laughs> koinonia. I got like four Greek words. Mexican. And like, yeah. But the beauty of it is I don't have to because the scholarship is so 
accessible mm-hmm. nowadays. So mm-hmm. available. It's just yes. right there. Okay, I want to move on. I love the study part, but that's not the only thing they devoted themselves. It says they devoted themselves to fellowship, which is the Greek word koinonia, by the way. What, what does it mean? smooth curve. Ah, you, you just that? threw that in? It's like a oh, radio broadcaster, yeah. the segue. Yeah. How, how, okay. Tell me about, okay, I'm going to go over here to you because you are actually literally a PhD in counseling. This is the center of Stephanie Kane. How do we be people that are true to the highest calling of fellowship in the Bible? How do we devote ourselves to each other? What does Here's that look like? Here's the amazing thing about God in science. There's an area called interpersonal neurobiology. I love and this. basically what it has found is that our brains are wired for interdependence. Mm. We are healthiest mm. in our brains and in our bodies when we are dependent on each other in healthy ways. Give me the title of that whole area. It's again. interpersonal neurobiology. Love it. And so science has found that our brain has evolved and grown to keep up with social interactions. And so when we are in toxic relationships or when we are um, isolated from people or rejected with from each other, actually pain centers in our brains start firing mm. off. So we are not healthy when yes. we are not connected to each other. Yes. And that's where you see God in science is that in his sovereignty, he said, not only am I telling you to be dependent on each other, but I have created your body so it is not healthy if you're not. Yes. You're, so many things go off. Your cortisol levels, those are stress hormones go off. You just, you have heart problems, depression, all kinds of negative things happen. So first of all, it's acknowledging that it's for your physical health, not just a spiritual obedience thing, but it's actually, if you want to be mm. self-serving with it, it's for your physical health. It lengthens your life when you are fellowshipping with people in a healthy way. Wow. So self-care is being in community. Yes. Self-care is being in healthy relationships. We're designed for it. We are totally designed. Biology Absolutely. Makes it for I've it. talked to church several times about the eight decade study of men where they asked the correlation, what leads to happiness? And they found it was not position. It was not possessions. It was not address. It was not background. The only correlation that could be measured to happiness was social intimacy. Mm-hmm. If I have someone who has my back, I'm yeah. happy. Yeah. If I don't, I am not. Yeah. And it, it's, it gets down to be that simple. And yet um, we're really, really good as humans at not doing that, even right. though we crave it and we need it. And intrinsically, when you talk about this area of science, all of us go, yes, we know that's true about ourselves. How do you, in our world of networking and sound bites and all those cliches, how do we connect deeper? How do we create fellowship? Well, I think it's to Isabel's point, you made a point about different voices, how there's just so many people speaking into. So we've got this greater social norm, which is part of growing up is being independent. It's individualism, you know, making sure that you're happy. and, And all. so the first thing you have to do is really push against that and try to block those voices or social norms that tell us that we are supposed to be able to look out for ourselves. I am a first. rock. I am an That's island. That's what makes me a strong person. Yes. This is what it means to be a strong woman. You can do it yourself. This is what it means to be a strong man. You know, you can handle it. First of all, let's just dispel that. That's that's just a myth. Let's just put that away. That's the first thing we need to do. I'm thinking of several best-selling books yeah. that you're completely throwing appropriately right. under so the bus right now, Stephanie. we just have to Stephanie. acknowledge that I those totally are not agree. true. That's not yes. true. That's Stephanie, what would your advice for. be? A lot of us, right, in times of pressure, stress, mm-hmm. sometimes failure, we tend to pull right back, in, right? And, and, this and, kind of and I just think defense. that work environment where you go, I've got to show that I'm yeah. the, how do you, in that stress and pressure, how do you do that? You know, it, it's going to take a lot of courage, but vulnerability can change the climate of an entire room mm. or interaction with somebody when you're willing to take the risk of being vulnerable and putting down all of your self-protection and putting it aside and go, you know what? I gotta tell you, I am scared or I am stressed or I was really hurt by what you said. Which is so amazing because it's, it's the most courageous thing you can do is, is to say I am scared in you, that social setting. You yeah. risk rejection and what did right. we find out about rejection in the brain? Pain centers go off in your brain. So you're gonna try to avoid rejection, but that's exactly what you have to risk because what you can get out of it if you're not rejected is so much more. Mm. Which is what makes this passage so beautiful and so rare, because they did it. They right. found right. they found this common cause in Christ and the and the sacrifice Christ made 
then all of a sudden, instead of working against each other, they're giving to each other as they have needs. And it's like this they're, altruistic experience just going round and round and round and round. I love it. I love it. Yeah. So, so Isabel, you know, every time in your home, you guys are the best hosts. You You're are. the most gracious. Very fun. fun. It it's is fun. It is fun. It's a French it's and Irish combined. Yes. Yes. Getting everything. Well, talk right about there, this. Right? No, no, no. Talk about yes. this because you yes. feel that you feel that when you go in your home, there's. There is, there's, they said the breaking of bread, that happens in your home. Oh, yeah. Baguette what? every day. Yeah. Yes. The bag, best French okay. bread you If you're can taking get. notes, yes. uh, be vulnerable, baguette every day. <laughs> baguette and you're good. Life will be perfect. <laughs> Carbs, you know, easy. Literally, yeah. where do you get your baguettes? Because not all baguettes are created. Yeah. Uh, Safeway's so. pretty good. Safeway's pretty good. Yeah, oh, we're good getting close. close. Not a getting sponsor close. of the flip side. Oh, so no. that was a free <laughs> not yet. endorsement. Not yet. It's going to blow up. <laughs> when you and Andrew have people in your home, what is... What is it? What are the th reverse engineer for me? What are you guys doing to create that level of fellowship? Do you know, I think hospitality is a gift. And I think yep. we've all been in homes where we have felt so welcome and other homes where we felt people wanted us to feel welcome, but we were just a little unsure of where to mm. go and where mm -hmm. to set your bag. And could you step in? Could you sit down? Was there food available? And I think for the purpose of fellowship, creating those beautiful, hospitable atmosphere doesn't mean a perfect Pottery Barn or West Elm Home, it just means a home that's intentional about welcoming mm. people. So our new home here in America has a guest room. That's what we love to do. And we have had so many friends, so much family, so many guests have come and we've been able to create fellowship. And so I do think food's a big part of it. Um, music can be, atmosphere can be. I think mostly your heart. If you prepare to open People not just that. your door, yes. but your heart. But we yes. can see that authenticity. I think yes. you know. We've I've been in homes where they've said, We're so glad for you to be here and we welcome you. The tone of it has been, don't, you break it, you buy it. <laughs> right. Right? Right. Or so everything's can, so perfect and my yes. life is also so perfect. And you're like, well, where is my perfection yeah. and yeah. fitting into Back this? Back to what right? Stephanie said. I think we're so deeply wired to sense whether we're welcomed or not. Like oh, our... Sure. We're kind of wired to go walk in a room and go, where am I in this room? Right. And I, no matter what you're saying or what's happening in the room, I can sense mm -hmm. uh, whether you want me. Mm -hmm. And then, like I see to the small group leaders, part of the training is going, you have to welcome people into your home. If you're going to lead a small group in your home, right. four times more than you think you do. Right. Because mm -hmm. they're going to come in with the assumption that they are not welcome and you're doing this as a religious duty and that you don't really want them there. You could really want them there, but if you don't go out of your way to be intentional, like you're saying, they'll leave and go, oh, they didn't really want me at that yeah. smart group. And that's why they don't come back. It's mm -hmm. there's we're so insecure in that fellowships thing, mm -hmm. you have to you have to go after it. But the flip side of that, do you like that? The flip side yeah, I really like that. <laughs> is that when you do that intentionally, the intimacy it creates with sure. us weeks right of yes. a church small group getting together and suddenly yeah. you feel like family right only god can do that yes. so a little intentionality on our part and then watching the holy spirit of god weave yes. us together and then just a level of just the personalities that come out the personal details the the pieces of you you didn't maybe feel you could share on week one but here you're on week five and you're mm -hmm. like oh did i just say yes. that right and did nobody get up and leave yes yes are we like friends are we family this is truly the family of god right, right. and you build that up and it's the most beautiful thing because yeah. you find community wherever you are and when you're a large church you actually become small and intentional in those moments yes. of fellowship. Yeah. That's where a lot of your discipleship happens mm -hmm. and a lot of relational traits come out in the best possible sense. Mm -hmm. You yeah. know, when you're talking about uh, they could just sense it in your heart. One of the things I, I, I say to the Thrive students over and over again, I said, our culture has done a really good job, and we're to blame, of teaching you how to network. You know how to build your likes. You know how to get people to subscribe to your podcast. But... But that's not the same as being a family. Right. And we've kind of said, we've kind of said, approach relationships like that. What can, uh, like in a mutual contract, a win-win. Mm -hmm. Oh, Stephanie can come on my flip side and she's got a PhD and she always says really smart, great content. And I can help encourage her husband. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then we have, a, we have a mutual benefit. There's something about walking into an environment where you go, I'm not looking, I'm not looking for anything from you. Right. I, I, I'm not looking for anything from you. I've gone to another higher level yeah. where if you never repay me, I'll be fine. I'm not expecting that. 
And that's, I don't think we teach that. I, I think we lower the standard of what fellowship means mm -hmm. to kind of a bartering system of relationship. That is so true. Instead of kind of going, there's another level. Mm -hmm. Right. And that other level super contagious, by mm -hmm. the way. Once you get to it, you go, oh, that's way better than bartering. Yeah. Now I feel supported and loved and belong, whereas before I was keeping a tab yeah. Uh, all the time. And I, I just go, I think our culture is, our social media is partly to blame here. Uh, just the marketplace mentality we have in our culture is partly to blame here. But somehow I want to call people in this passage up to the biblical level of family right. instead of the bartering level of friendship. Right. And, um, and there's a level of confidence, a level of acceptance, right, that you bring, not just by serving great food or having a beautiful living room set up, but by saying, I welcome you as you are, and I'm going to respect what you said. I'm not going to try and change you, but I'm mm -hmm. welcoming what you've just said. Yes. And here's where I am. And so it yes. has to be, there has to be a right. level of reciprocation in that. Yes. 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 Right. Right. If there's not that reciprocity, then it's like, well, okay, you've got a problem. I don't. Where are we? Right. Yes. And I think it yes. just takes that opening up. Mm -hmm. And so then trust starts to yes. be a two-way thing. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And, uh, and it's built over time. But I think it starts when you open up your heart for sure, yes. as well as your home. Well, certainly one of the things that leads to that higher level of fellowship is the next thing they were devoted to, which is prayer. Um, and, you know, it's funny because prayer, I don't think, meshes well with our current American culture or maybe our whole Western culture. It's not, it doesn't seem very productive. It, there's no real... Um, checklist you can do it prayer is a mystical thing it's a supernatural thing it's a private thing even in public it could be a little awkward i meet people all the time that have been going to church for 20 years have never prayed out loud in right. public mm -hmm. so isabel mccourt here's my question to you pastor of prayer extraordinary wow um how should i be devoted to prayer if i'm a person and i i'll put myself in this category who frequently finds myself run out of things to say after three minutes, and I never run out of things to say in prayer. How do I devote myself to prayer? Wow, that's such a great question. Um, I absolutely love the fact, first and foremost, that anytime I sit down or anytime I slow down, even if I'm busy, anytime I slow down this head or this heart, and I take time to tune in with God, that He is there. He's, he's waiting, He's talking, He's ready to listen. Mm. And I'm just amazed at His goodness and His kindness every single time that happens. So how you do that is really interesting. You can do that as you stop and you can do that as you go. Mm. And so um, as you stop, there are so many options. As you go, it's that constant awareness it's so good, Isabel. that That's God so is with us. Yeah. He's here, He's everywhere. I mean, yes. he, he lives in heaven, yes, but then He's holy. Holy Spirit is a part of the Trinity that yes. He has left on earth, which means He's right here. He's actually within me. And, and if I tune in, if I listen, if I pause, I will actually find out what He's saying about absolutely everything at absolutely every single time. So this is a day-by-day, moment-by-moment uh, experience that you have to choose to engage in. And often it's putting um, in our daily lives just reminders. Hang on. And while I've got busy with whatever is going on, there's maybe a post-it, there's maybe a little frame, there's maybe a reminder on my phone, there's maybe a person I'm talking to that suddenly makes me just stop in my track mm -hmm. and go, oh, hang on, God yes. wants to be involved with this moment. That's, I mean, as you say, people think prayer is this great mystical thing and these special clothes, special places, special beads, whatever. God's just here when you're ready to just tune in and listen to him. So on the go, you can de definitely develop that sense. But as you stop, there are so many ways of making space. I love that. As you stop and yeah. go. I when uh, Early on in my Christian walk, I someone told me the story of this uh, missionary to American Native Americans who would go in the morning early before the sun and he would go outside in the winter cold and he would bow down and he would pray so hard that snow melted three feet around him. And that story hurt me badly <laughs> because for about a decade, I tried to be that guy. And um, not only did I get cold, no snow melted. <laughs> but right. I never made it 10 minutes without going, this feels stupid. Um, and I just, I like that so much better. Right. that God, what do we learn in Colossians? God fully came to fully die for us, to fully be with us. He's, as I stop, he's there. As I go, he's there. Yeah. I don't, Jesus literally says, I don't have to be lengthy. Right. It's, I develop the awareness of the presence of God, not this epic, 
devotional moment mm -hmm. that I could never achieve. And then this condemnation layer builds up on me. I'm a pastor who doesn't pray. And my devotions were only 11 minutes and 30 seconds mm -hmm. this morning. I bet you Andrews were 12, 50, <laughs> you, know, you know, all that stupidity. What you said really spoke to me because um, I was just dealing with some anxiety of transitioning from being at home to going to work. And right. I'm like, God, I'm going to get busy again. And mm -hmm. I'm going to like just totally forget you. Right. I'm not going to acknowledge you like I did. Right. And what's going to come out of that? Because so much fruit came out of last year when I was at home mm. and I was able to take some time and focus on the Lord now that I'm in the office. So yesterday I'm in my office and I'm getting ready to teach a class that night and I'm putting together my presentation. I've got books and notes everywhere and then I've got administrative stuff I'm working on. And I stop and I go, I just asked, I was like, OK, I just got to bring God in because I'm in my zone and I'm totally not acknowledging him at all. And I just said, God, is this what you want me to do? Like, is this what, what I'm doing right now? What I'm doing here? Is this what you want me to do? Mm -hmm. I kid you not, the Holy Spirit immediately responded and said, relationships are so important to me. You teach mm -hmm. people how to relate to each other. Mm -hmm. right. Keep going. Wow. And but I he kid spoke, you not, right? The right second then, he asked, he spoke right then. because you and tuned just, in. I tuned in right yes. there. I, yes. I felt that I was veering farther and farther away. And I was just like, it's better for me to interrupt myself and stop this work because God will redeem whatever I just missed. Mm. Right. It's better to stop. It's just that constant fear of if I stop to read my word, if I stop to tune into the Lord, then there's this other stuff that I didn't attend to and that's going to get messed up. And I'm like, no, if I if I'm obedient yeah. to the Lord, God is going to redeem that stuff that I had to stop for him. Yeah, right. got to put an engine just, on it. Yeah. And it's knowing to do that as a yeah. first response, yeah. right? Not our last course, yeah. just a first response. Yeah. God, whatever is going on, like I'm just going to call to you right yeah. here in this moment, knowing you're going to... I mean, Jesus said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Right. And then the ascension happens and he leaves us, right? Mm -hmm. But then he said, but I will send you my Holy Spirit mm -hmm. and he will be the one that will counsel you. And, and it's an awareness and we grow in that. Mm -hmm. And the more you you call on him, the more you realize he's actually here. But as you stop, Kurt, you go back to where we're, we have so many systems, so many ways in which we can actually dedicate time to prayer. Um, here on the Granite Bay campus, we have a prayer room. You text pray to 56316. That gives you an what? hour you there. What? You text what? Pray. pray. Just pray. P-R-A-Y. Like, P-R-A-Y. How simple can it get? Mm -hmm. And we help you in that room. We show you That's what awesome. it is like to pray for one whole hour. Mm -hmm. And we often joke, the reason why it's there is not so that we can teach everybody else. It's so that I can be entertained for long enough or actually stimulated for long enough to pray for a whole hour. And there's a system there that follows the old ACTS model. Um, ACTS standing for um, adoration and then confession thanksgiving, and the old-fashioned word supplication. So mm. we kind of transform that a little bit. So it's uh, got a format to it that guides you along. So yeah. your first step is if when you have actually planned to stop, whether it's for five minutes this morning mm -hmm. or whether you actually have an hour that you have planned to spend with God, you spend time, first of all, remembering who is He. Now here's the thing I like about booking time into right that now. into that room. Is first of all, let's just face it, my house, your house, your house, it's chaos. Yeah, it's chaos. It's chaos. Yes. The yes. garage is chaos. Right. The bathrooms are chaos. The right. kitchen's chaos. Homework is being had. You know, my kids get on the phone. They're yelling at their friends. <laughs> I don't know what they're talking about, right. but I can hear them from the backyard. And it's not, my house is full of life, but it's not a prayer environment. Right. The second I pull myself out of that. And also the other thing is I love just the idea of that simple outline that you've given, because what happens is you think an hour of prayer is impossible. Right. I have never went through that system afterwards where I went, oh, that was, that, that was a waste of my time. I've always left that going, why don't I do that more? Mm -hmm. right. that, that, that's refocused me in such a way that I'm gonna get way more done. Mm -hmm. That's changed my attitude on three issues that were just like a constant nag in my, the back of my mind. And it just, in fact, last week, just like you were saying, Stephanie, I was like, Lord, what am I doing? Things are so busy. And I just stopped myself. And the Lord said, have Isabel and Stephanie on the flip side. Just <laughs> boom, he spoke to me. And I was like, that's it. That's the answer. And that's why this episode awesome. has been so Praise awesome. God. Now, here's what I want to say. We're nowhere near done talking about this. I'm just going to get 
um, to the, we're, we're out of time, but I was just going to get to the signs and wonders and miracles. Does God still answer prayer? Are miracles still available? Why don't they happen as much as they seem to happen in the Bible? If I invited you guys back, would you actually answer some of those questions? Yeah, love to. Oh, for sure. I'm a living miracle. You so are. I'd love to share that with ah, you. Don't tell yeah. the story now. They got to tune right back in. All right, Hannah, you got that. We're going to have these two back as soon as possible. We're going to go back into this question of really how does prayer work into our lives? How do we see miracles? Can we see miracles? Is that manipulative? Is it wrong? theology? Are we going to make everyone in the Reformed tradition mad at us? Um, or does God still work today? Let's let's go after that uh, in an upcoming episode on the flip side. And as always, you know, I'm, I, if you're just tuning in to hear the fact that science proves what the Bible says about fellowship from Dr. Kane here, that's worth it enough. Would you take even just that part of this podcast and send it to someone who's feeling a little isolated, a little lonely, needs to be encouraged, needs to know you love them? Would you do me a favor right now? Like, share, 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 and subscribe. Because as always, on the flip side, what we're trying to do here is we're trying to get all of God's truth into all of our life, not just weekend God's truth, but all of our week, God's truth. So do us a favor, like and share, share, share and subscribe. Thank you for joining in and we'll see you the next time on the flip side.